Voyager was a pioneering iteration of Star Trek, with Kate Mulgrew in the lead as the fearless captain there's coffee in that nebula Janeway. There's a great variety in the rest of the crew, leading to one of the most diverse cast in Star Trek history at the time of its making. That is a spirit that we really want to retain in this fantasy casting. And we don't usually do this, but can I get a red alert please, Chris? Because I think we need to be super clear for this thought experiment. We have some rules, I'd like to throw them at you before we crack on. One, this is an absolutely fun what if type scenario. Two, we won't be casting anyone who has shuffled off this mortal coil. Three, budgets. Budgets, man. Money has no use in the 24th century and it has no use in my imagination. So with that being said, I'm Marcus Bronzy and here is our list of the perfect actors for a modern day Star Trek Voyager reboot. For fun. Number 12, Seska, Numi Rapos. Seska is of course the turncoat Cardassian infiltrator assigned to spy on Chakotay's marquee cell. Once she finds herself get flung across the galaxy, she quickly reveals herself and escapes to work with Voyager's enemies. Knowing that she is a spy does nothing to affect the rewatch and Martha Hackett did a fantastic job of bringing the shady character to life. To capture this fully, the new actor needs to be able to switch from deeply trustworthy to an in and out villain on a whim. Numi Rapos of course bursts onto the screens with the girl with the dragon tattoo. Since then she's appeared in many other roles with Prometheus being one of her biggest to date. She's able to play both vulnerable, terrifying and display a power that suggests one should never mess with her. This a go from me. Number 11, Icheb, Noah Schnapp. Icheb was originally played by Manu Interreme, who revealed that recently the character was the polar opposite to how he identified at the time. He was delighted to be able to expand the role as he was continually brought back, as there is something very interesting to how a Borg child adapts to life again. Noah Schnapp is of course best known as Will Byers in Stranger Things. From the first season, he's had a lot of heavy lifting to do when it comes to the male cast. Battling the Demi-Gorgon and the Mind Flayer is no light work at all. And he's continually risen to the challenge and impressed. To see him adjusting to life again, guided by our pick for Seven of Nine. Oh, wait till you see who we have lined up for that. Anyway, as I was saying, guided by our pick for Seven of Nine, it would be a fantastic opportunity to again delve into the psychology of being torn from the collective through the eyes of a child. We can only hope that this Icheb has a slightly happier fate. Number 10, Kez, Lily Reinhardt. One of the two Riverdale cast members to feature in this list, Lily Reinhardt would make an excellent choice for a rebooted and hopefully a far better written version of Kez. Kez is a fascinating idea for a character. She only lives for nine years, so every element of life that she samples, she must live to the fullest. She quite literally does not have any time to spare. This could lead not only to great comedy, but also great tragedy as well. How does one find their calling in life when these things often take years to master? And she's only got nine. Reinhardt has starred in Riverdale since the beginning of the show. As Betty Cooper, she's been everything from a reporter to a dancer. She's even been a gang member and nearly a murder victim. While Riverdale is absolutely bonkers, it has delivered again and again on its concept. If Kez were treated as suggested above, Reinhardt has shown that she's malleable enough to jump through hoops that would be set down in front of her. Number nine, Neelix. Eric Stone Street. The character of Neelix has been slightly polarizing over the years. Some people find him adorable and love him. Other people just want to smash his rubbish cooking down his own throat. I like him. He's one of the most essential characters in the show. Neelix is both a guide and the morale officer aboard the USS Voyager. To truly capture that, an actor needs to display both a wisdom, yet a playful energy in their part. Eric Stone Street is perhaps known best for portraying Cameron Tucker on The Modern Family, one half of the same-sex married couple alongside Jesse Tyler Ferguson. His upbeat optimism and hilarious line delivery has shown that he can absolutely deliver when it comes to the comedic side of Neelix, yet he has also shown that he can play both sweet and serious as well. Whilst he may disappear beneath the Talaxian makeup, there's no question that Stone Street would of course bring wonderful joy to the show. Number eight, Harry Kim, Charles Melton. Charles Melton is an American Korean actor who has risen to prominence thanks to his role in Riverdale, where he plays Reggie Mantel. He took over the role from Ross Butler when the latter had to leave the show due to his commitments to 13 Reasons Why. To play Harry Kim, he brings not only the confidence that he's displayed in his other roles, but also his youth. 
Harry Kim was dubbed the Forever Ensign, as we all know, due to his absolute inability to get a promotion. He's an essential member of the crew on Star Trek Voyager nonetheless. He's often the one to save the day, even if he never truly believes in himself. And while the rest of the crew come to depend on him, he still finds himself the butt of many jokes on the butt end of the galaxy. Knowing how popular the character was, it would make sense to give him more screen time this time around. Last time the character was nearly written out at the end of the third season. Charles Melton with his screen presence and popularity is more likely to bring more and more and more and slightly younger fans to the show. Number 7. Tom Paris, Miles Teller Miles Teller is seriously impressive. I mean, look at his role in Whiplash, he kicked ass in that. And also, he stood out in War Dogs. And before you get to me about the Fantastic Four film that was a critical flop and also a commercial flop as well, that wasn't really down to his bad performance. He was actually quite good in it, if you have a look. Tom Paris has to walk the line between both likeable and questionable. He's not quite the bad boy of the ship, but he does need to show some rebellious tendencies. To capture the Tom Paris spirit, he needs to have almost failed his way up the ladder. And when Janeway recruits him, it's because he's a great pilot, not because of his service record. Teller has shown the right level of snark in his roles to be able to be a bit of an annoyance, whilst not truly crossing over into the land of untruly unlikable and evil. He's also shown that he can play buddy roles as well, something that will be essential when doing their scenes of Cracked in Proton with the lovable Harry Kim. Number six, The Doctor, Stanley Tucci. Done. Like a Band-Aid, the original Doctor was a hologram designed to be used for a bit, then chucked away, so he had no personality or bedside manner. However, over the seven seasons of the show, it was clear that there was a lot for the holographic character to add, so casting a charismatic actor makes the most sense. Stanley Tucci is one of those actors who is simply brilliant in everything he's in. And that is not to say he hasn't appeared in a few stinkers, I mean, the silence, but he can generally raise the class of any piece he's in simply by showing up. Were he to appear in the blue uniform, you only need to think of some of his cutting remarks from The Devil Wears Prada to imagine his bedside manner. But he has shown so many warm and caring performances as well throughout his career, and it's very simple to imagine the Doctor's softer moments with the Tucci in the role as well. So, in Fantasy 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 Reboot time, not only is the Tucci the Doctor, but let's write in that mobile emitter a little bit sooner than later, because confining this man to one set, well, that would just be a shame. Number five. Belana Torres, Ana de Armas. Ana de Armas rose to prominence with her turn as Joy in Denis Villeneuve's Blade Runner 2049. She beautifully captured the hologram, presenting a warm and loving partner for Ryan Gosling's K. Also, don't forget, she pulled off a cracking performance in Knives Out. She would be perfect for the fiery half Klingon chief engineer, Belana Torres, who's a character who's ripe for deeper exploration of who she is, where she comes from, and what drives her. In this new era of Klingons that had a little shave in season one of Star Trek Discovery, but I guess that's for a different video, it would be extremely interesting to see how this split is represented in her character. She can play sensitive, she can play strong, she can play Belana. Number four, Tuvok, Charlie Barnett. Tuvok is one of the most interesting characters in Star Trek Voyager. He was the first Vulcan that we had truly seen in a starring role since the days of Spock. And Tim Russ, he kicked ass. He played that part perfectly. He was able to balance the curt nature of the security chief with the caring soul that lay just underneath that level of pure logic. Charlie Burnett has been rising to fame over the past decade in a variety of roles. He appeared in the fantastic Netflix series Russian Doll, along with you and most prominently Chicago Fire. Although he's quite a bit younger than our choice for Captain Janeway, the ageless nature of Vulcans means that this shouldn't make any difference. He could actually be older than her and still look younger. Tuvok and Janeway have an amazing bond as well that goes beyond service, something that Burnett would be more than capable of delivering on. He's also no stranger to fantasy and science fiction, as he was cast in the final series of Arrow as well. He's certainly one of Hollywood's up and coming actors, and today would be a great choice to cast him on the show. So come on down, Burnett, you got the job. Number three, Seven of Nine, Anna Taylor-Joy. Anna Taylor-Joy burst onto the scene with Robert Eggers' The Witch, a dark and atmospheric period horror that showed her as more than capable of carrying a film as the star. Since then, she's continued to impress in Split and its sequel, Glass, Thoroughbreds, The Secret of Marabone, and most recently in Netflix's The Queen's Gambit. 
Seven of Nine, originated by Jerry Ryan, is of course back in Star Trek, appearing in Star Trek Picard. Therefore, this recasting falls completely into the realm of fantasy. But if this was to happen, Taylor Joy has quickly emerged as one of the most fascinating actors of recent times. She has the ability to make the audience care deeply for her, whilst being able to show the less savoury side of her characters as well. Seven of Nine, recovering from her time with the Borg, has made highly questionable choices in how she deals with others. There is an element of standoffishness that anyone needs to bring to this role. Taylor Joy would make an excellent drone and an even better, a stellar seven. Number two, Chakotay, Gil Birmingham. Robert Beltran has gone on record several times to voice his dissatisfaction with how Chakotay was handled in Star Trek Voyager. To be fair, he has a point. From the beginning, the writers attempted to use his Native American character to show a spiritualism in Star Trek still exists, but this was used less and less until it seemed to kind of fizzle out altogether. Gil Birmingham may be best known to audiences for his role in all five of the Twilight films, but don't let that put you off though, as he is an incredibly talented actor. His turn in Wind River would banish any doubt about this. Chakotay need not be defined by his native ancestry, yet if he is to be addressed, then it needs to be done in such a way that isn't pandering nor exploitative. In Voyager, there are episodes which feature the spirits that his people worshipped who were shown to be aliens. This mixing of alien and human natures is something that deserved deeper exploration. While Chakotay was relegated to somewhat an odd anecdote about his heritage, there is ample amounts of material to make him not only an essential member of the crew, but have Native American history and experiences on the full show rather than simply teased. Number one, Captain Janeway, Julianne Moore. Few who have seen Julianne Moore act could doubt that she would easily and convincingly step into the role of a starship captain. Captain Janeway nonetheless, she's capable of both high drama and intense comedy with all of the range in between to bring something truly special to that part. When Kate Mulgrew was cast as Catherine Janeway, she did a phenomenal job with absolutely no notice whatsoever. She replaced Geneviève Bouchold, who had left the role after a mere two days. Therefore, she certainly made the role her own, rather than having the writers work with her initially to craft the perfect part for her. Janeway in the early episodes was a very ill-defined character other than a strong leader. She is leading a ship many thousands of light years away from home, but she needs to be in charge. She needs to be vulnerable as well. Julianne Moore has many examples of powerful performances. She was a leader in Children of Men, a despairing mother and a wife in The Hours, and a highly strung celebrity in Maps to the Stars. She was a fantastic replacement for Jodie Foster, taking over the role of Clarice Starling in Hannibal as well. She could easily lead the team, though it is very easy to imagine her relaxing around her trusted lieutenants and allowing the audience to see what really lies beneath. I've been Marcus Bronzy and this has been Trek Culture. Please don't forget to drop us a like and a sub on YouTube. You can also follow Trek Culture on Twitter. I too am on Twitter, Instagram and TikTok at Marcus Bronzy, M-A-R-C-U-S-B-R-O-N-Z-Y. Or you can catch me on Twitch.tv slash Marcus Bronzy weekdays at 9am GMT. Peace.